Welcome to the CAA's Columbia at Home series. We're so glad you've joined us. I'm Gibson Knott, Senior Director of CAA Marketing and Digital Initiatives. Tonight, we're pleased to welcome back members of the Columbia Career Coaches Network for a new program on making a successful career transition. After the panel discussion, we'll have an audience Q&A. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit a question. We'll try to get to as many as we can in the time that we have. The panel will be moderated by Eric Horwitz. Eric is a graduate of the Columbia College Class of 1990 and currently serves as the head coach for the Columbia Career Coaches Network. I'm now pleased to welcome Eric Horwitz to Columbia at Home. Thank you very much, Gibson. Um, Really excited to be here. And uh, just to let you know that I, uh, in addition to running the Columbia Career Coaching Network, I also am involved in all uh, the digital aspects of Columbia alumni and ensuring that we uh, share as much information as possible. And I also have a coaching uh, network where uh, people can come together during this time and share their experiences, which I'm excited about as well. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Caroline. So she's going to tell us a little bit about herself as well before we get started. Hi, my name is Caroline Sinise Olivian. I'm Barnard class of 93 and stay involved with Columbia uh, teaching salary negotiation at Barnard's Athena Leadership Center. And I'm a an adjunct at SEPA, where I teach professional development, and I run the career curriculum for Columbia Business School's executive program in management. And I'm a multiple time career changer, so I love talking about career change and excited for the rest of the program. And hey, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Julia, come say hi. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us again. Uh, so I graduated from Teachers College with a degree in psychology, found myself on Wall Street as an executive search professional for 23 years, went back to Columbia for an advanced coaching intensive certification, and then found myself working uh, at a college helping newbies uh, to land positions. Uh, while still being an executive coach. So I'm thrilled to be here to discuss a lot of the shifting sands and things that are changing and how we stay afloat and even perhaps thrive in this type of situation and market. All right, thank you so much, Julia and Caroline. So uh, each of us are gonna give sort of a five minute uh, tips or things to think about or when, when you are thinking about or considering a career transition and hopefully this will uh, give you some inspiration to think a little deeper and to understand this process. Uh, so I'm gonna start first. And uh, I just wanna say this, a career transition is a very stressful and interesting and transformative opportunity in your life. And probably why this has always been a challenge is because either your mother or your father once said to you, what do you wanna be when you grow up? So if you think about that question, it only would have one answer, right? Not what are the things you wanna be when you grow up, but what is the thing you wanna be when you grow up? When my mother asked me that, I said I wanted to be an astronaut and she said that was too dangerous, so I needed to go back upstairs and think of something else, okay? So number one thing to think about is that question, what do you wanna be when you grow up, is not a good question. So, uh, things to think about when you're thinking about this point is, number one, human beings, the average age of somebody is now, you know, late 70s or even 80s. So the idea that you are going to have one career over all the span of time sounds near impossible. Secondly, in order to be somewhat of an expert in any one field, it takes about 12 years till you can master it. So at that point, after 12 years, you may actually get bored with the thing that you mastered. Right? And if we say we're gonna to live to 78 or 80, that's a couple careers in there. Number, number three in that, what do I wanna be when I grow up? A hundred years ago, uh, boys worked in a coal mine and maybe died at 15 and women <laughs> died in childbirth, right? So there wasn't a career, there wasn't a long span thing, there wasn't even idea or notion 
of all these things that we have now. So this whole concept of your career is, I mean, you know, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. It's very new, okay? And finally, what happens to us over all this time is we mature physically, we change physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. We're evolving beings. And obviously there's a lot more self-help in the world now. And so we're evolving. So what you wanted to do at 20 and what you want to do at 50 can be different because you've changed. So my second main thing I like to help people with is what is your immigrant story? So what does that mean? Oftentimes when people come to this country and a lot of people come to this country from many different places, the first generation is you know, in some working field, right? And they say to their children, you should be a doctor or a lawyer or something in the professional field. So then the second generation is generally a doctor or a lawyer or something in that way. Then the third generation generally will move into the business, like into the business area, to make a lot of money or to not necessarily need a title in order to gain acceptance in a new country. And then the fourth generation basically wants to save the world. So when you're thinking about even making your career change, you gotta really think about, you know, where's your family from? How long have you been in the United States, for example, or any country? And where are you in that immigrant story? Because that story is a very powerful narrative that can affect them. And finally, I just wanna say, if not now, when? We had COVID and I want you to think about all the industry, there isn't a single industry that hasn't been upended. And they could be upended for good and upended for bad. So if you go through, even you can write this down, government and politics, food, real estate, travel and leisure, consulting, any of them, each one of them, and I can tell you, Caroline and Julia, we work with different people, are experiencing this massive change. So if you're thinking about changing, all the cards are up in the air now, it's a good time. So that's kind of my like tough stuff to think about. And uh, now I'm gonna turn it over to you, Caroline, and maybe you can share some perspectives. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. So I agree 100% with some of the things that you pointed out regarding that we're going to have multiple careers. And, you know, my journey, I started out training as a classical pianist. I attended Juilliard. I did Barnard's, uh, Barnard and Manhattan School of Music joint program. I uh, thought for a long time that I was going to be a pianist. And then when I got into college, I realized I didn't even like classical music. Mm -hmm. So I think that a lot of times you you kind of fall into these these roles based on perhaps what your skills are, perhaps what you were told when you were younger. Um, the other thing that I was super interested in was all things money. So I double majored in economics, found myself in investment banking, management consulting, then I did retained executive search, then I missed the arts. So I left corporate altogether and became an actor. And I always tell people, I don't take that career change lightly. I went from six figures to three figures. So. Um, you know, as an actor. So obviously I was not only doing that. Um, I started coaching people. I started taking on recruiting projects. If you told me 20 years ago that I would be an entrepreneur doing a number of different things, I would have told you there's no way, but then here I am. And that really happens to a lot of my clients that, you know, career change isn't linear, that it takes a lot of experimentation and that many times you're going to be doing things that you hadn't expected that you would be doing. And that's okay. And so, uh, you know, I think I'm going to mention a couple of things that I think that are counterintuitive for folks. So one is that when you want to make a change, you want to banish the words new change or transition from when you're telling your story. I always tell my clients, and I did this myself, and this is how I was able to move into many, many different fields. I split my time now between recruiting projects, coaching projects, independent film projects. I'm a stand-up comic, and I invest in real estate. And that's why my website is called Focus is Overrated, because I do a lot of different things. And I didn't ask for permission to do any of these things. I just produced a film, and I just did a real estate deal, and then I called myself a film producer and a real estate investor. And so banishing the terms new change transition is a really, really good start. But the other thing that I'll mention, having been an executive recruiter and having recruited for over 20 years now is that the recruiter self, myself, would not hire my career change self. 
So you want to be thinking about the mechanics of a job search and what employers want. They want the person who has done the job before. And so you want to be thinking about how am I going to present myself uh, if I haven't done the job as a job, how am I going to present myself in a way that assures them uh, that, that I can do this? And then the final thing that I'll say that might be counterintuitive for folks is that um, part of being a career changer is that you're willing to walk away from perhaps the story you told yourself before or maybe your original goal or goals. So I mentioned that I started as a classical pianist before I realized that I didn't even like classical music. And it was a really uh, tough transition for me to think about having spent really my entire childhood since I was uh, basically the age of three, playing hours and hours of music a day and, and forming this vision of myself that I had to be willing to walk away from. I had to be willing to say, hey, it's okay. I kind of ran the, you know, drove this train <laughs> as far as it's going to go. Just not interested in doing it anymore. Got what I got out of it and it's okay. And that's going to happen uh, to a job or to a project or again, to the story you tell yourself. So it's just something to think about. Um, and then I'll give it over to Julia. All right, thank you very much, Caroline. Julia, go ahead. So just to piggyback on the fact that this is a historically different time. Um, we've never in our lives before had five generations in the workforce ever before. That means you have to really figure out who you are and what you bring to the table. I call it your professional identity. Um, most of the time when I'm coaching, people come to the coaching process in a state of fear because things are changing and we resist change. We like things to stay the way they are. And one of the things that's most beneficial is to switch your thinking, to, not to what's happening to me and I'm gripping and I'm afraid and I won't get a job or I won't be able to pay whatever bill, but to actually switch your thinking to be, what do the employers need? And two, what problem am I solving? There's never going to be an interview that you go on where at some point when you figure out why you are there and what problem you're solving for the employer and you communicate that clearly to the employer, you will move forward. You will nail that interview. And it's um, a point that is worth speaking about because in a marketplace where so many businesses have been upended um, prior to COVID, we were having a little bit of an economic issue and after. And it's put so many people in a state of panic, particularly the people you might be interviewing with who are also worried about their jobs. Um, we are all doing more with less and there's extra stress on the system and on the human capital. So it's really important to figure out what skills you have and don't be afraid to go learn some new ones. Your brain is pretty plastic right? 40 years in the business world from age 21 until maybe 61, your brain might want to learn new things. In fact, it might die if it doesn't. And many times you're put in front of situations that represent a crisis because it's a change. So you have to learn something new and it winds up being the best thing for your career. Um, so think about your professional identity. This is what I work on with my clients, the, the unique skills, assets, traits, that you bring to the table. And then think about what you did when you were a kid and time flew, what you were doing when time would just pass, whatever it was. Um, most of the time, mid-career shifters say, you know, I always loved that. I just couldn't pursue it because of X, Y, Z. It wasn't this, it wasn't that. And so the um, overused phrase journey and path that you are going on career-wise if you allow it, embrace it, and say to yourself, I'm going to go with this and learn and develop new skills in this world, those are usually the, the traits that wind up um, with people having the best results. Thank you so much, Julia and Caroline. Okay, we're now going into the exciting question lightning round. We had submitted many, many, many questions. So I'm going to... Uh, share some, I'll answer some, and hopefully this will answer some of your questions and then we'll have the opportunity for, for you to submit some more. Um, so I'll start with you, Caroline. You ready? Sure. 
Okay, all right. Are there some job functions like HR that are recession proof? So I actually wrote about this. So I, I have a career column on Forbes and I wrote about trends to watch 2020 and beyond. And one of the things that I wrote about is that the only hot skill is going to be reskilling because there's going to be so much that changes and change is happening more rapidly. So I hesitate to say that there is going to be any one thing, you know, so right now it's uh, machine learning and design thinking and big data. And there's, you know, there are definitely hot areas for sure. And then there are very specific skills like, you know, R or Python or things like that. But, but then that's not going to be true probably five years from now, or the expectations are going to be different. So I think it's less about, what's going on in any one particular functional area. I think Julia had said, what are the problems that you like to solve? That's definitely a question uh, that works. And if you want to experiment with that, you know, go, uh, you know, just really think about the business publications that are out there that you like to read, Fortune, Forbes, Economist, et cetera. Don't read them cover to cover. Just look at the headlines, look at which articles you would want to click on. So what industries do these represent and what, problems are they talking about? Uh, are they talking about entering a new market? Is it a turnaround situation? Is it some kind of you know, revenue growth situation? Is it working with people? That'll give you a better indication of perhaps what you're interested in. And then you can translate that into the functions of today. But five years from now, 10 years from now, of course, those answers will be different. And so uh, you really don't want to go in there thinking, okay, I'm going to do this now, and that's going to save me for uh, the rest of my life. Because I think everyone's going to be a career changer, if not immediately, uh, sometime in the future. So Caroline, you're, what you're basically saying is there is no such thing as a recession-proof uh, career. I think there's no such thing as a recession-proof function. I think that you can be a recession-proof person if you're willing that. to scale all the time. Yeah. Right. That's a great way of saying it. And you can be a recession-proof person by following the tips you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Okay, great. All right. Julia, general yeah. tips on how to get in the door when making the transition. The most important thing to remember and the reason why people get hired is A, because they have the skills that the job needs and B, because the person liked them or the people or the team liked them. They wanted them on their team. It is very important to be able to develop relationships where human beings, we all see how it feels when we can't talk to each other or go out to dinner with each other. Now mental health is, is on the rise with issues because we naturally need to connect with other people. If you are someone who is naturally great at building relationships, you have an advantage. If you're someone that's not, that it doesn't come natural to, that's also fine. Um, but work on that. Really work on that because there are people who in interviews have the interviewer smiling, laughing, talking more because they're asking questions, really smart questions about the organization and the job. I don't believe in selling hard in an interview. I do believe in asking questions that demonstrate you're truly interested, you're authentic, and you're curious. So getting in the door in this marketplace is very simple because there's so much online. It's no longer a secret. It used to be when I was in executive search, which VPs are doing this job, which managing directors are doing this job, look on their website, everyone's there. Then you dovetail that with LinkedIn and you say, wow, we went to the same college, he played lacrosse, our kids go to the same school, whatever it is, there's so much overload of data that you can use that to your advantage by making sure that you have a way to connect with someone at an organization that you're interviewing with, and you may not always have that. That's all right. There is absolutely a way if your skills match the job and your resume states that clearly and your LinkedIn demonstrates and showcases you clearly. I have not met anyone whose skills weren't an exact match for a job that couldn't get an interview. They may not have landed the job, but they were able to get an interview because they had the skills, the tenacity, 
and they didn't give up. It doesn't happen perhaps on the first week, but if you stay at it, I've never had an employer that didn't respond when someone said, I've been trying to get to see you and I'm not sure what else can I, I can do. Maybe I can do a project for you for free, volunteer for 90 days. And if you don't think it's a great project, don't hire me. And if you send that kind of a message to someone on LinkedIn, you're going to get a response in most cases. So it's really just the methodology that is often lacking when people are laid off, transitioned, furloughed, there's no method for now, what do I do? How do I move this forward? What do I wanna do and how do I figure it out and how do I get hired? So if you can work with a coach, define the methodology, feel like you're moving forward, turn off that itty bitty, not so good committee in your head that said, I'm a loser, I can't do this, oh my God, my life is over, then it will happen. Uh, okay, that's great, Julia. So you're also saying technology today really makes it much easier. It truly does if you know how to use it. All the, in, the information is now public. Mm. Who people are, what their backgrounds are, where they went to school, where they live, what they do for a living. You know, people put on LinkedIn what they want you to see. And there's an art to working LinkedIn without stalking people, but by saying, I noticed this about your background. I just applied to this position. My background is this. Would you mind having a 10 minute coffee chat with me? Guys, we are Columbia. You have quite a large network. The young generation now, class of 2020, they're all about, hey, I had a job offer and now it's reneged. Now I know you, can you connect me here? Can we have a coffee chat? But be very clear with what you're asking someone. Don't say, I don't know what to do with my resume. What kind of, what should I do with my life? Right. Say, I'm interested in data science. I have a math background. I like X, Y, Z. This is the job at your company. I sent my resume. This is the person hiring. Do you think you might be able to connect me to someone that might help me with this process? Make it easy to help you and people will. People love helping people when it's easy. Thank you. So um, the next question I'll, I'll answer. Uh, <laughs> blogging, podcast, YouTube, what is the most effective way at this time to get considered thought out there? So what I want to say about this is all the tools, all the social media tools and Google and YouTube and Twitter and, and TikTok are all methods and all should be considered when creating your digital persona. Because employers oftentimes will get your resume, but search your Instagram or your Facebook, okay? Because they wanna see who you actually are. So what I like to do is make a list of every single tool that's out there, consider that any person can see any of them, and what are the messages that I'm specifically wanting to share in all those platforms, and being comfortable with, with each of those, and being able to express my true self, what I, what I want, what I like, um, understanding that that is essentially my real resume, as opposed to the thing that I wrote and put in a PDF and emailed them. So I would say each of them, all of them, and you need to be as proficient as possible. Sometimes when I work with older, older people, they're saying, oh, I'm too old. And I say, it's not that you're too old. It's are you using the technology to show what you can do regardless of your age? And so you're more reflected by your ability to use technology than your actual physical age. Uh, okay. All right. Um, Caroline, you ready? Sure. Yeah, okay. Does it make sense, I think this is a hard one, to go to grad school after a long gap, say 30 years? So there, I feel like there are several questions in that. There's the, should I go to grad school? There is, should I go to school after a long gap, right? And then there's this kind of implied question of, and if I didn't do that, what else would I be doing, right? And so I think that's really the, the question. It's funny because I've, I've been teaching at SEPA for so long, and yet I'm one of these people that says you don't have to go to graduate school and you don't have to go get a formal certification or get an advanced degree, depending on what it is that you want to do. Now, I actually know someone who was a banker who went back to med school to be an anesthesiologist. Now, he had to do that in order to, to do his chosen profession. I wouldn't want him reading self-help books and then trying to get a residency out of that. 
But for other folks, there are other things that you can do uh, from taking on pro bono assignments, from doing consulting, um, from you know reading voraciously about a topic, etc. I think that people automatically glom onto grad school because it's a structured program. You will meet people, you will have some hands-on learning, and you will have a degree and potentially a brand name, depending on where you go to school, uh, in in your background. So those are all good reasons. Uh, for going to grad school, and they're all helpful to make a career change. But you have to also think about there are costs to that, uh, the money, the time, the opportunity cost of what else that you could be doing. And depending on what the cost is, the payback, the return on that investment, depending on when you're, you're going to be doing it, if you're 50 and planning to work for another 10 years, are you going to be able to make that back? And how much do you want to do this? So there are just a lot of questions uh, to plow through. There's no one right answer for anybody. And hopefully, you know, some of those factors that are kind of listed out there uh, will give you something to think about and will give others on this call something to think about as they're weighing whatever their next options are, because we could have talked about grad school, we could also talk about uh, what are the benefits of taking a six month returnship or a three month unpaid internship or potentially relocating somewhere. So again, pros and cons, time, money, opportunity cost. So, so Caroline, in a coaching situation, you would unpack this with somebody into its deeper whys or what? Yeah, absolutely, because the grad school is the how right? Sometimes it's, it's a, a why in and of itself. People want to have, they've always wanted to get a PhD. They've always wanted to get a master's in this particular discipline. Um, but just based on the, on the question and based on the topic of, of the day, typically, you know, when people ask me about grad school, it's grad school is not the end game. It's the means to something else. And so really what you're trying to what I'm trying to, to verify as a coach is, you know, what is that something else? And what's the best way to get there for that person? And again, it might be grad school, it might be something else. That's great, thank you. Okay, Julia, I think this one's a good one for you. Okay. How do I let recruiters know I would seriously consider relocating when I've spent many years in the same city? Well, there's an icon to do that on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way. Um, let recruiters know you're open to relocation. That is an icon to check. Um, on almost every single job application, they ask you a million questions now. Are you open to relocation? Or in your LinkedIn, the About Me, it's right there. The minute you apply to a job, someone is going to be checking out your LinkedIn profile. So make sure you have one. Your picture is good. It's not in your pajamas. You, you look like your picture now. I know we all used to look great, but you have to show up in the interview and they have to recognize you. That's important. And you can put in the about section, born and raised New Yorker, open, geographically open, depending on the opportunity. In other words, if this is a compelling opportunity, geography won't stop me. That's really what you want to let people know. Not just I'm, you know, I'll take anything, but based on the opportunity, um, open geographically to considering excellent opportunities. It's an easy way to let people know that. Julia, have you seen anything with COVID in terms of working from home that changes that at all? Well, um, it's now going to be a seismic shift in the workforce because firms are now realizing that their real estate is expensive and they're in many cases having people who say, I have kids at home who don't go to school just every other you know, three hour period that I'm not working virtual. So this COVID virus has transformed the thinking of the educational system, who's online, who's not, the work system, who's online, what can be done virtual. But what has not changed is the mission of the organization. And what has not changed the mission of education systems, we need to, businesses get our products out we need clients if you can do that from wherever you are i am not in san francisco or anywhere near it so if you can prove your value the earned privilege is hey guys i'm going to be working from here and i'm not commuting two hours a day each way anymore those days i hope 
are being rethought because it's smart and it's efficient not to have people commute one to four hours per day. So think about your geographic flexibility, particularly now with COVID. Um, it also allows you to see how forward thinking organizations are. I know an employer who asked someone to show up physically in an interview a month ago, and they said, no one's doing that. And they were stuck in that mentality. So that's very telling about an organization. You have an, a shot now to be more geographically flexible than ever before. So take advantage of it. Thank you, Julia. Um, okay, so the next question I'll answer. How personal can I get when explaining why I changed careers? So this one, I mean, my personal opinion is to go ahead and risk being authentic because what it will tell you when you're authentic about your career change is about who you're working with. So as a personal example, I switched careers to become a coach from an executive at PricewaterhouseCoopers and I took a year off and I was raising my children. So when I went for a job, I said, I explained that I took a year off to raise my children and the person was a father also who was admiring the fact that I had taken the time to spend time with my children during that break, right? So when you are authentic with a career change reason, you run the, the risk and the opportunity that the person you're talking to either admires you for doing it, has done it themselves, and it will get the conversation into a much deeper, uh, more connected uh, situation. And if the person doesn't get it, doesn't agree, doesn't like well, your answer because you didn't give a stock answer, it's probably also ultimately not gonna be a good fit for you. So I say, go ahead, tell the true reason because also the stock reasons are been heard so many times that they don't even sound believable and then you don't sound believable. So um, I would practice that in advance. You know, you can, when working with a coach, you can practice that authentic transition conversation and if it rings really true, it will be attractive to uh, employers because they'll know you did the thinking and the work. Okay, um, we're gonna have one more question for Caroline and one more for Julia. So Caroline, um, how do you, how, okay, how to network with someone online without being awkward and have deep conversation? So, so I think there's, there, again, there are a couple of things to unpack here. So one is the networking online and the other is a deep conversation because a deep conversation can happen and you can imagine that you're on a Zoom with someone that you know well. And just because you're on a Zoom as opposed to a phone call or as opposed to a coffee face-to-face, -face, you can still have a pretty genuine deep conversation because you know them the medium is not as important there because you have this history. Now, obviously, if you aren't comfortable on a video call or you have a terrible reception or something like that, that makes it harder, right? So I'm assuming that the technology is there and that's a hint to the, the first part of it, right? Is that you need to get comfortable with virtual networking. So that's comfortable with Skype, Google Meet, FaceTime, Zoom, however the person wants to meet or however you're, you're finding that people want to meet. You have to get comfortable with that, know how to work your webcam, have a comfortable microphone, all of that kind of stuff. But then secondly, you also want to have a genuine ongoing relationship. Um, it isn't about inviting someone to connect on LinkedIn and then immediately saying, can you help me do X, Y, Z? I think that's what gives networking a bad reputation. It becomes like this two-step process, the approach and then the request. And the best networking is actually four steps. So before the approach, there's the research. It's looking that person up. It's trying to figure out, okay, when I approach this person, how am I going to do it in a way that shows that I'm genuinely interested in them and not just anybody that I could be talking to and that there's a clear reason why they might want to interact with me. So that takes some research and that takes some preparation. So step one is research. Step two is the approach. And then before the request, if ever, right? Because you might just be having this great long-term relationship. Before the request comes the follow-up. It is not about 
hello and what can you do for me? It's about hello and then how are you? And oh, hello again and let's have another conversation. And maybe at that point, there comes the request. And so follow up is, is really important and most people don't really uh, do a lot of that. I know when COVID hit, I emailed and I called hundreds of people just to check in and to see how they were doing. And so many people were really grateful that I, I did that and really wanted to talk. We're now all Zoomed out, but before right. it was kind of fun to get on Zoom and have social Zooms. But, um, but, you know, so that's, but, you know, I, I did it because I was really curious about how people were doing. I wanted to reach out. I wanted to rekindle that connection at a time where I knew that people would be really stressed and really worried. And I'm talking about 300 reach outs. So you really want to be thinking about, am I only reaching out to people when I need something? Because if so, that's right. That's not good. Not good. Um, but otherwise, uh, if you're reaching out over time, developing a relationship, whether that's over phone or email or Zoom or live, when we can do it live, uh, that's how you develop those deep connections. And then when we can do it live, you got to follow all those rules you said. The same still, way. yeah, you still absolutely. It's not just hello and what can you do for me. Right. Uh, great. Okay, Julia, one more from the past and then we're going to get into the live Q&A. Uh, how would you advise change for those unable to work full time, example, due to family obligation or health limitation? Well, you have to be authentic and honest. There's no hiding behind that. There are many, many needs for someone to work part time. There are many, many openings that are billed as contractors for short periods of time, two days a week, three days a week. Um, there's no getting around it, but I think it's a different type of work need. So you have to really be very clear with your employer what you can offer, how many hours in a day are you speaking about? Is healthcare part of that or not? I don't have any idea what kind of industry this is speaking to, but um, consultants and freelance people are hired all the time. Once again, I don't think it's ever about the quantity and always about the quality. Um, really strong people that do their jobs well, um, people will take them for 10 minutes a week if they can bring a new idea or help drive an initiative forward. So I would focus less on the time, but be very clear with the employer what you are bringing for that time period and make sure that's clear. Okay, very good. All right. Um, are we ready for the live question? Roll it. Okay, here we go. Um, Carolyn, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the first one. Okay. I'm currently working in a middle office role for two and a half years, and I've been looking forward to transition career path to the front office. The lack of front office connection and experience made it extremely hard. Is there any suggestion? Thank you. So I talked about in the beginning that you embody the change, right? You don't talk about the change. You don't highlight how new you are, that you're making a transition. Um, you, you do the things that you say that you're going to do on, on the job. And so when I've had clients who have made the switch, you know, I had an operations professional with 20 years of experience, who had a big role in, in a middle office function who really wanted to do business development. And so I said, well, why don't you put together deals? Why don't you start advising companies and making introductions and get yourself known as a deal maker and as a connector? Because no one's going to believe you otherwise. And so I think you need to think about what you mean by front office, if it's a revenue generating function, if it's a client relationship function, and try to put yourself in situations where people can see you in that role. So maybe there's something that you can do within the company that's cross-functional, where you can demonstrate some, some client service, maybe because you're putting together a panel for an affinity group, or um, you know, maybe because you're helping with some sales or marketing collateral, which will get you closer to that front office. But I think whatever it is that you say that you wanna do, I think it's important that you actually start doing it. I give the analogy of career changers being like the icky ex-boyfriend or girlfriend who's begging to come back 
and they're like, tell me what I need to do and I'll just do it. And of course, you don't buy that because you say, well, if you really loved me, you would know already. And that's just to say that if you really wanted to be in whatever that front office function is and that you deserve to be there, you'd be doing something in and around that space already. And I wouldn't have to tell you what that is. That's good. All right. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, I'll answer the next one. How to balance passions and financial constraints. So what I like to always think about when you do a career change, is it is completely possible that you will be cutting your revenue in half or a third because you're moving into something that you're not as skilled in and this will be a, a shift in your financial situation with an equal return in being more connected with your passion. And when you're more connected to your passion, you, the way your eyes light up, the way you deliver to the work will, will show value that was not seen before when you were burnt out, annoyed, and unhappy. So inherently, when you're trying to balance those two, at first, it is going to probably affect you financially, but you're making an investment in the future where your passion will start to show through. And a way to get connected to that when you're thinking about passions versus financial constraints, even if you're considering a job change, is to start to make a list of things that you love, that you actually love. And they can be in a lot of areas of your life, like food or movies or actors or actresses or art, where you really wanna access what you're very passionate about that you would do for free. And once you understand what those things are, then it can help to drive, you know, working with a coach in terms of what are careers attached to those passions. And I would say, number one, reduce your expectations around your financial situation, which may also include having to do something you're passionate about and also something that you're dispassionate about for a period until the transition is complete. Otherwise, you'll try to do something new, you won't be able to pay your rent, and then you're going to go right back to where you were. So this is like the balancing act of all balancing acts. Okay. So, um, Julia, you ready? Ready. Please comment on ageism. So this is real and it's um, a prejudice that's out there that no one's talking about, so you know it's real. <laughs> and experience is what none of us had when we were 21 and all we wanted to be was older because people just kept telling us we had no experience but we didn't know how to get any experience now those of us that are on the other side of that curve that is, have been doing something for over 20 years have all this experience okay that's the good news about getting older is that hopefully you've been doing a lot more and you have something to show for those years of experience make sure you're showcasing it Make sure that you are not a stranger to technology. That is a game changer, a level of the playing field. If you're still trying to figure out your Zoom and your microphone's off and there's flying cats in the backyard and you're getting up and you're not dressed, none of that's gonna work. That's gonna separate you as someone from the older generation that's never gonna get with the technology and that's going to be a management headache. Use your experience and show everything that you've done and why you're more qualified, but stay abreast of technology, which is the only real way that the workforce can say, you can't get this job because you, know, you don't know Excel. Make Excel your friend if you're going to be in finance. Take a class, learn something, push yourself into your greatest area of discomfort and get comfortable with that. Um, and then, don't look for positions with entry-level people. Look for positions where your experience is valued and leveraged. And don't be afraid to start doing the work and to say, I know that I'm changing careers and I haven't done X, Y, Z before, but here's a portfolio of some of my work and X, Y, Z that I've been actually starting to do. This is all about minimizing the risk to an employer. That's what a resume does. That's why they ask college kids a GPA. What have you done somewhere else so that I can get comfortable that you're not going to mess up here? So it's all about minimizing the risk. And the only reason they'll hold ageism against you is if they think you're going to take longer 
or um, create any kind of management headache or perhaps have a real big ego and are going to be difficult to manage if someone happens to be younger than you who's your manager. So I think, Julia, what's interesting about that is sometimes I'll hear people refer to ageism when I know that's not the issue. So if you make it your go-to, you might miss the point of what feedback you're getting. Correct. Like anything, right? Any, you know, just be really open to, you know, there's no failure. There's just feedback. Mm, that's really good. Um, okay, uh, Caroline. Sure. Uh, what do you do with a PhD that you don't need anymore? Can it make you overqualified? Is there a good way to frame it to make it relevant? Yeah, so relevance is about the person that you're talking to. So depending on what you're, you're trying to do, I, I said earlier that one of the, the things that you need to do as a career changer is to have the courage uh, and the constitution to walk away, right? And to say that you're okay, like not doing something. So I talked about for, for myself, classical piano, I don't know what your PhD is in, but you know, the, the piano example, uh, it's interesting. I've had employers who have introduced me as someone who studied at Juilliard even though it was actually a, a very analytical position and there's no way that I would be doing anything that was remotely related to my, my music career. But I think they just thought it was one of these cool things. And so what you did before, so this PhD, could be useful to the other person because they think it's a cool thing, because they know that you've done exhaustive research, because they know that you have been able to persevere and to actually finish and you're not an ABD or you didn't stop at, at just the master's, you went all the way through to the PhD, depending on what your area of expertise is, the actual expertise uh, might be something that is relevant to whatever it is that you're, you're trying to do. So I think it's about, and this is for everybody on the call, it's always about understanding your audience and figuring out what is relevant to them. And once you understand like what they're looking to do, to Julie's point about risk minimization, what are they afraid of in, in hiring you, what their constraints might be, um, once you start thinking and putting yourself into the shoes of the other person, whether that's a networking contact, a hiring manager, a recruiter, whatever it is, and thinking, what are they going to be looking at? Then you can start looking at your background, whether it's having a PhD or having some other technical degree that you don't need anymore, or perhaps having 10, 20, 30 years of experience in something that you feel like is not relevant to the other thing. And then you can massage it. It's only when you understand what the end game is, is that is when you're going to be able to make that transition and that bridge and explain why it's relevant. I'm sure it's relevant for some reason. I, we would just have to uncover what that is. And you may not know why, like you're saying, it's relevant to the person listening. Yeah, but I think that that's your job, right? That's your job is to understand what their concerns are, what their constraints are well enough so that you can translate what you did to them. And that's why I gave that analogy of the, the icky ex saying, oh, please, you know, just tell me what to do. And it's like, no, if you're really interested in whatever it is that you said that you're interested in, you would have researched it as exhaustively as you did your PhD, and then you would know how to talk to them. And you wouldn't just expect that they would somehow uh, understand your background or appreciate your background because, you know, they might not. Um, so Caroline, that question leads to the next one, which I'll ask myself, which is, <laughs> self, are employers less concerned about gaps in your resume today than they used to be if you had long stints at companies before and after? So from my experience, after 2008, the obsession with having no gaps in the resume started to drop. So you were able to have a drop because you could say, well, there was the financial crisis and then people were more open to a conversation. So the dogma and stigma around never having a gap definitely lessened. I would say after COVID, it should be officially dead, okay? However, there is a way to work that, th that process through so that it's a very comfortable conversation. And the way I like to do that is basically developing your career hero story. It's gonna have a beginning, a middle, it's gonna have an exciting situation and then a, maybe a little bit of a tragedy and then an exciting little hydra that comes in to fight you off to get you to where you are now. 
So if you sit down and really write down, even from childhood, like if you were selling lemonade, what is your career story? So like Caroline's saying, she has a really exciting, interesting, diverse story. Then you can weave into it why the breaks happen, what you did with the breaks, and what you learned from them, and where you went. Okay, Because the most important thing I like to tell people is like, your career is a jungle gym. It's not a ladder. Okay, So it's not just going to go up, 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 up up it's going to go here and then it's going to swing over there and then it's going to happen there and you want to tell a compelling story about it so if you sit in an interview and you ex and you just let them ask you questions you're going to get they're going to be like so why was you why did you have a break from november 2008 to january 2009 and then you'll be like well i worked at lehman brothers okay so that is not the way to tell the story to tell the story is to have the story to know the story and to be in conversation about it um, and that's a much more interesting, compelling way to not have anxiety about the gaps. Okay. Uh, Julia, ready? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, how do you, I mean, it's a big question. So um, how do you career transition, translate your skills and avoid being typecast from your experience in your current, in your current profession? By divorcing your skills from the job. So I worked in investment banking doing executive search. Now I work at a college helping students. But what I really do is help people navigate their career transitions, right? So if you can take the core of what you do and say, I help people solve their financial problems. I help people with their healthcare needs. I like to breathe a story into numbers and help figure out where data trends are leading so that I can help a company stock, help with financial advice, you know, help my kid at school figure out what's going on. You can really take that core, the professional identity, the core skills that you have, divorce it from the function because you put that in that function, you can put that in many other functions and the employer on the other side needs to be very clear with what your assets and skills are. I love presenting orally, I'm a great communicator, I hate accounting, I love this, whatever it is, make sure that you're very clear on your skill breakdown. Um, and the other um, small piece I'll add to um, what Eric was just speaking about, my favorite interview question now is what did you do during COVID? Mm. What'd you do? And you can bet those people that said, well, I taught myself a coding language, taught myself French, taught myself piano, I played Xbox, who would you hire? So gaps in a career, you didn't do nothing, right? I wasn't working in that job, what were you doing? Well, honestly, I started volunteering and I saved 180 shelter puppies, whatever. Show me who you are and how you made use of your time. That's really what an employer is hoping to get. That's great. Okay, so I'm gonna read this last question, but it's not really a question, it's actually a statement. And then I'm gonna sort of share something and then Caroline and Julia, and then we can do this to wrap it up. Hello all, this is not a question, just a comment for all the speakers. Thank you from my heart for all of your wonderful insights. It is challenging and scary to be in a transitional moment like this in one of the most uncertain times in history. It's nice to know that people in transition are not alone and have great ways, methods, and techniques to move forward. So I would just want to say is I appreciate the comment and a little of the reason why I'm in the field I'm in is because when I left working in uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, I didn't know anyone because I only knew the people that I worked with. And I thought it was so terrible that I would dedicate my life to a career and then have absolutely no network. And I thought to myself, I don't want other people to ever have to feel that type of fear as well. And that's why I do what I do. So I thought maybe Caroline and Julie, you could think about maybe something that compels you to do what, what you do to inspire people and to know that we also really appreciate like the feedback. Sure. Uh, you know, so my, my motto is I, I help people make a great living doing work they love. And so I think it's, it's two things. Someone had asked the question about passion and about money. And I just don't think that financial reward and fulfillment are mutually exclusive. Um, I think that obviously there are certain jobs that pay more than others. I've had 
bankers who have moved into nonprofit and they've taken a hit because nonprofit doesn't have those big banking bonuses. But they didn't take a hit necessarily in base salary depending on you know, what it is that they were doing. And then I've had people go the author direction. I had recently uh, someone who wanted to leave media because it's a, a crushing industry and there's just a lot of, of disruption there and flat salaries and all that. And got a 72% pay raise because she was moving into the life sciences. So she's moving the other direction. Uh, but in both of those cases, I think similar to what Eric was talking about with uh, you're going to, to get paid in other ways, there's financial compensation, there's psychic compensation. And so I think you can, you can go after both of those things. And don't let anyone ever tell you that you have to choose one or the other or that you have to choose just one thing. I mean, this is why I, I do what I do is because I couldn't do just one thing. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that I could find a job posting that encompassed film production, real estate, career coaching, recruiting, writing, et cetera. So I just made one for myself. And that's something that you want to consider doing too. Thank you, John. Okay, Julia, what's your this, like? This is one of the most compelling times to be in the market and the most open times when diversity of backgrounds and diversity of thought is not only welcomed, but it's sought after by employers. Um, 20 years ago, I was coaching in an investment bank and I said, I need to coach on work-life balance. And I didn't get the assignment because they said, we just want you to coach the head trader and he just has to perform. And I said, but if he got divorced that morning and he thinks he's losing custody of his kids, he might not be performing that well. I had to go there with it and they just glazed over and they said, forget work-life balance, just coach on performance. We've come so far and anyone in the market right now is benefiting from the fact that we are no longer saying the work part of you and the personal part of you never speak. We are one holistic human being. And even the top Fortune 500 companies know that now. And they're only attracting the young professionals because they have pool rooms and granola bars and snack areas and happy hours. If you are not fulfilled in your career currently, it's a wonderful time to take stock and figure out what's missing. That's why you're not happy or sad. It's a good thing. So then you know something's missing, figure it out what it is and move to your area of greatest discomfort. And you will find that you'll be very thankful that you did and the sense of productivity and like, look what I just went through, but look what I made out of it. Um, and this is an incredible time to be doing that. Thank you. So um, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us with this hour. Uh, Columbia Work From Home has other uh, programs which you can also join in. And we shared all of our information um, in the chat bo box. So please, if you'd like to reach out to any of us, hopefully we can help you or find someone to help you. And um, as, as Julia just said, it's like, and Caroline said, and I'm saying is, this is an opportunity to grow. So don't look at this as a tragedy, but as an opportunity for which the whole world is facing together. So thank you very much and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for organizing. <laughs>